Hi, everybody, and welcome to A Time for Change. I'm Alexis Christophorus here with Sabil Marsalis. This month marks 30 years since attorney Anita Hill testified during the Supreme Court confirmation hearings of Clarence Thomas, telling a Senate Judiciary Committee and the world that Thomas had sexually harassed her when they worked together, allegations that Thomas denied. Hill's testimony, given before 14 white male senators, lasted three days. I have no personal vendetta against Clarence Thomas. I seek only to provide the committee with information which it may regard as relevant. It would have been more comfortable to remain silent. It took no initiative to inform anyone. I took no initiative to inform anyone. But when I was asked by a representative of this committee to report my experience, I felt that I had to tell the truth. I could not keep silent. Anita Hill is now a professor of social policy, law, and women's gender and sexuality studies at Brandeis University. She's also the author of the new book, Believing, Our 30-Year Journey to End Gender Violence. We talked to her about her new book and how testifying before Congress changed the trajectory of her life. I can't think of anything that I would do differently right now about my testimony. What I would do differently about the process is, is uh, something that I've written about and I think about a, a lot. Um, for example, I would have a process. I would have a process that was clear, that uh, I knew exactly what I was going into before it happened, um, that I would know even before I um, sent in my statement wh where it was going to go, um, who was going to see it on the committee, uh, what kind of opportunity that I would have to respond or what opportunity other people would have to testify. Um, and what we had was a process that was far less than clear, seemed to be evolving the whole time and that excluded witnesses. And so that would be my correction. After the hearings, Clarence Thomas was confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. How did that impact your life and career pursuits? You know, I'm not sure that his confirmation actually changed my career. I think what happened was the public responded to a, a system or a process in, in terms of the hearing that um, vehemently vilified me. Uh, and I think that was the source of, of uh, any changes that came about, but basically, um, I ended up leaving my job at the University of Oklahoma. The job was threatened before I, I left. It was clear that there was a great deal of hostility uh, against me um, coming from state legislators. It wasn't universal, but it was enough to change um, the culture and environment that I worked in. And um, I ultimately left though, because I wanted to do more with the issue of sexual harassment and other forms of gender discrimination and violence. You know, Anita, Clarence Thomas used that now infamous uh, term, high-tech lynching, uh, following your testimony back in 1991. And in many ways, that language not only turned him into a victim, but it also sort of stopped a, a lot of the open conversation around sexual harassment. Do you think his choice of language actually impacted progress for women at the time? I, I think it was used to provide cover for his own bad behavior. Uh, I think it was a misplaced metaphor uh, because um, he was not only claiming his victimhood, he was claiming his victimhood as a victim of racism. Uh, to have that launched um, in the context in which it did was really um, insincere. And not only did it provide a cover for him, it, it went on to provide a cover, cover for others who would use the same metaphor, the same, and, 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 and did, in fact, I think, stifle the conversation at that moment. But then almost immediately after, a group of women, African-American women, in defense of ourselves is what they call themselves, they helped clarify the fact that um, in the history of lynching, no man of any race 
had been lynched on the basis of the word of a black woman. So the lynching metaphor was um, his cover, but it was also used as a weapon to exclude me from um, the experiences of African-American women historically and that continue on today. If you look at the R. Kelly uh, trial, it took 30 years nearly to get his victims to be heard, all of whom were black women um, and who were dismissed for 30 years. And then ultimately there was some gender justice uh, found for those victims. So it's been a long time coming, but I think we're starting to understand that those kinds of excuses do not represent our best interests. And let's talk about the role of President Biden during those hearings. So at the time, he was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee during the Clarence Thomas Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Now, he has since called you to apologize for what you went through. But now that Biden is president, is there more that he should be doing on the issue of sexual harassment? Well, and, and this is absolutely the reason that I am here today and the reason that I wrote the book, Believing. Uh, we are 30 years out of 1991, and yes, there were mistakes made. But the problem today of gender violence of all forms, um, and I talk about them in the book, whether it's sexual harassment or intimate partner violence or bullying in schools, the problem is that it still exists. It continues. Uh, we set a bad precedent in the 1991 hearings but that doesn't alleviate anyone from the responsibility from doing about doing something about what is going on in our workplaces, in our schools, in our universities, and on the streets and in our homes today. Uh, I think the president has not only the ability to change, to change course with this problem and, and commit to addressing it. I think he has the responsibility to do so. Coming up, we'll have more of our conversation with Anita Hill after this quick break. Welcome back to A Time for Change in our conversation with Anita Hill. It's been 30 years since Hill testified before a Senate Judiciary Committee alleging that she was sexually harassed by then Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. She has devoted her career to the fight against gender violence and taken a closer look at what corporate America is doing and in some cases not doing about sexual harassment. We talked to her about her work and about what inspired her to write her new book, Believing our 30-year journey to end gender violence? Well, uh, first of all, it, it, it is uh, drawn from hearing thousands, literally, literally thousands of survivors and victims and believing that they deserve better from our leaders, from our institutions, uh, from friends and colleagues uh, who often dismiss um, uh, charges out of hand without even a fair chance at a hearing, uh, or they deny them altogether, or they deny the harm that is caused. We are just now beginning to understand this. And I know that much of your audience is a business audience. What we know for certain is that there is a huge loss, personal, uh, health loss, uh, productivity loss in businesses. Um, there is an economic loss because of the loss in productivity. Um, and for all kinds of reasons, I know um, that businesses tend to run, you know, looking at risk and, and cost, but for all kinds of reasons, these issues need to be addressed by our business leaders as, as issues that if addressed, can make much or much more productive uh, and effective operations and, and cultures and climates within our organizations. So um, we, we, we aren't there yet, but we need to 
very much understand that the problems of sexual harassment are not going to go on their way on that uh, away on their own. We need to understand that what we have now in many places and many organizations are systems that fail to address the problems and that we need to take a hard look within our organizations to make sure that we are doing everything we can to keep people safe. And Anita, speaking more about that, you wrote, quote, each of us has a role to play in making our world safe for everyone and that together we can end gender violence. How do we end sexual harassment and gender violence? We've got to acknowledge it and really challenge the systems that we now have in place. Many of them are truly set up to put all of the burden of change on victims who have been uh, vulnerable. Many of them, um, you know, are so costly or so obtuse that people don't have any idea of how to navigate them. Workers don't have an idea of how to navigate them. And then when they find out, they realize that it's too costly, especially if you're a low income worker. We set up systems that make the risk of losing jobs so high that they can't afford to complain even. Um, and then finally, one other thing that we, and this is not the final thing, but just for, for, for today, one thing that we've got to address is retaliation against people who make claims. Their rights are being viol violated when they do so, but that doesn't stop people within organizations from retaliating against people once they've reached out, gotten over all of the hurdles and uh, raised complaints, gone through the, the uh, proper uh, processes in the way that they are told that they have to, then they face retaliation for doing so, for complying with the rules. And so those are just three areas. Acknowledge the problem, make their systems transparent, have full investigations, and stop the retaliation. All of this has to happen though at the leadership level. Uh, it has to start at the top. We know that about organizational change of all kinds. And if you're gonna change our organizations, we have to have leaders on board and demanding that change. And what about corporate America specifically? What can companies and the men and women inside them do to end sexual harassment? Well, I think I, I laid out, um, first of all, Leadership has to acknowledge that it exists and that it's hurting not only the employees, uh, but especially the employees and workers throughout their organizations, whether they're direct victims or no. But secondly, they must acknowledge that it is hurting productivity and the effectiveness that people can have in the workplace. It's costing them money. Um, and so that's one thing that we need to start with leadership acknowledgement of the problem and prioritizing solutions. Leaders can also bring in, uh, in consultation to develop whatever the solutions are, whatever the processes are, bring in survivors and victims to help them craft solutions that will work. So often um, now the stories that I hear are that the solutions that come in are there to protect the people who are in power. The Hollywood Commission, which I chair, has uh, done a survey. And this was just, we just closed the survey early 2020. Uh, but what we found was that people still doubt, a majority of the people, the workers in Hollywood, in the entertainment industry, um, the majority of them felt that there would be no accountability uh, for bad behavior if the person who is accused and found guilty uh, or to have committed abuse is a person with higher power and authority than the person who is the accuser. So, and this was across the board uh, people of all genders, um, 
people of all statuses just didn't feel that there would be accountability and leaders have to change that message and they have to change what is a gap in trust between the people who are working and those who are leading. And that was Brandeis University professor Anita Hill, author of the new book, Believing, Our 30-Year Journey to End Gender Violence. And coming up, you'll hear from one of the women behind a powerful podcast called Because of Anita. Welcome back to A Time for Change. I'm Marquise Francis here with Seville Marcellus. After Kerry Washington, Me Too founder Tarana Burke, attorney Kimberly Crenshaw, and former Senator Carol Mosley Braun, those are just a few of the high profile women featured in a powerful new podcast released this month that examines the long lasting impact of Anita Hill. 30 years after she stood before the Senate Judiciary Committee testifying that she had been sexually harassed by then Supreme Court nominee, Clarence Thomas. The podcast is called Because of Anita. And here to talk about it is one of the co-hosts, co -host, Salamisha Tillett, who is also a Rutgers University professor and contributing critic at large at the New York Times. Dr. Tillett, thank you for joining us today. After having, for having all of those dynamic conversations on the podcast, what is your biggest takeaway from Anita Hill telling her story and its overall impact. Yeah, that you know that moment in time in 1991 is uh, something that's ongoing. That we're still confronting those issues, um, and that we're still, as we just heard from Professor Hill herself, uh, dealing with the legacy of Black women, of women not being believed when they come forward with allegations of sexual harassment or sexual assault. So that was the biggest takeaway. You know, one. Uh, what was the impact of her testimony? Uh, the fact that so many women within the year after her testimony started coming forward, uh, not just to run for office, but also to share their stories of sexual harassment. Two, that we're still dealing with the ongoing legacy of that. That's why we need Me Too. And three, uh, that we don't really have the resources yet or the critical will to combat this pandemic of gender-based violence. It's been 30 years since Anita Hill testified. Now, she continues to advocate for organizations to change their cultures, to avoid the productivity and financial costs that can come with sexual harassment. In your opinion, mm -hmm. how does corporate America value Anita Hill's message? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think we've seen within the last uh, four years as a result of Me Too and then the last 30 years of Anita Hill, some uh, important policy shifts in, uh, in, in corporate workplaces. But the idea that Anita Hill and later on uh, Christine Blasey Ford are still considered whistleblowers, that their uh, attempts to speak their truth to power is seen as an anomaly as opposed to uh, the norm is something that I think corporate America and as well as academia and, and government, all of these institutions are still grappling with. So on one hand, I think there was a direct impact of her testimony, a shift in policies and, and practices in corporate America. And yet we can still see that it's still um, so hard for people to come forward saying that they've been sexually harassed without the fear of uh, losing their job or uh, other repercussions in the workplace. And Dr. Tillett, I covered several President Trump rallies in the lead up to 2020. And one that really sticks out to me is when I went to Rochester, Minnesota, when Justice mm. uh, Brett Kavanaugh was being nominated. And I asked women, how are they feeling? And there was an overall sentiment that I kept hearing over and over Oh, women have, have felt this before, you know, she needs to get over it. And I was really mm. taken aback. And so I know men, number one, have the responsibility to do better. And I think even as a man myself, calling out other men to do better, this should not be something that's happening in the workplace. But 30 years later, do you feel as though men have learned their lesson? And I say that because I saw on the podcast right after Anita Hill, I believe, Black Women to God an ad in the paper, and mm. then right after uh, Ford, I believe multiracial men, um, you all pointed out, took out an ad. But yet, there's also that kind of tinge of uh, Supreme Court uh, justice at the time, 30 years ago, setting a blueprint. Mm -hmm. So so have men really mm -hmm. learned? I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation, right, um, is, a, is a sign of progress, meaning that uh, 30 years ago, uh, African-American men, African-American uh, reporters, 
African American male reporters were not actually taking Anita Hill's allegations seriously. So I would say this conversation is a mark of progress. And as you pointed out, the ad that uh, uh, that 1,600 men of all races took out in support of Christine Blasey Ford as a, as a mark of progress. And the fact that she was probably believed, right? Like that, I think that's pretty true in our podcast. We talk about the fact that they actually were both believed is progress. Um, but the same time, and Professor Hill talked about this before, there's a weird way in which gender-based violence is seen as a women's issue, right? So because women are the primary victims of gender-based violence, of sexual harassment and sexual assault, even though men and boys also are victims, there's a weird way in which uh, women being and girls being victims of it means that it's our issue to take on to combat. And the real issue is that is the people who disproportionately commit these acts of, of, of crime and acts of violence. And that's that's primarily a men's issue. So I think you're right to point out that it needs to be reframed um, and it needs to be both a racial justice issue as well as an anti uh, anti um, sexist issue. Mm -hmm. And you you spoke to some amazing people on your podcast. I listed a few of those names earlier just to kick off this segment, including Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, who had mm -hmm. the first public conversation with Anita Hill. And you asked Ford and all of your guests how Anita affected them. So I'd like you to finish off this sentence because of Anita. Oh, well, it's really simple. Because of Anita, I knew that sexual harassment in the workplace shouldn't happen. And that sounds simple in some ways, but you could imagine I'm going into the workplace as a 21 year old. And I think that I'm not supposed to be sexualized, that I'm not supposed to be harassed and I'm supposed to uh, be treated with equality and fairness and justice. And that's because of Anita. So she shaped a whole generation of men and women who entered the workplace. And we believe that we should be there without fear of um, harm and, with that, and, and treated fairly. Absolutely. Salamisha Tillett, thank you for joining us today. Again, the podcast is Because of Anita.